immediately, please, um, so that I don't do it. And if I'm holding it too far away, tell me about that as well. Um, I was really happy yesterday coming up on the train for two reasons that are related to each other. One is, aside from raising a child, this is the most important thing I've done in my life, is the climate change work. And all the time I've been sitting down in London doing research for the various booklets that we've done and so on, um, uh, about climate jobs in the UK, I've been thinking regularly about Scotland. Quite a lot about Scotland, but for two reasons. One of which is there's an obvious political opportunity in Scotland for climate jobs that is not there in the same form in hardly in anywhere else in the UK and not there in the same form in most places in the world. One of those reasons is not just the devolved government in Scotland, but the very strong nationalist feeling in Scotland. And the, that nationalist feeling is also in many ways a class feeling. That's in a sense the opportunity from the top, but there's also a very important political space from below. I know that the Scottish trade union movement is in desperate straits. I've been a British trade unionist all my life. I'm well aware <laughs> of the kind of place we're in. But the class feeling, the union feeling, the kind of basic social democratic morality that has long been in these islands probably survives best in Scotland of any of the places it survives. And you can see that the Scottish Nationalist Party is not the Ukrainian Nationalists and that there is a reason. And it is that tradition. Um, and this is also an industrial country uh, with long and deep skilled industrial traditions, which are very relevant to what I'm about to talk about, about climate change. But the other reason that I was very happy to come up to Scotland, which is not, it will not be immediately obvious why that was, but it was because of my dad and it's connected to climate change. Uh, my father, Scotland for me is associated above all with love. My father came to Scotland when he was 12 years old in 1937 and fell in love with Scotland and stayed in love for the rest of his life with Edinburgh and Glasgow and the Highlands, above all the Western Highlands. And he took me from the time I was three until the time I was 65. Um, Probably most years, he took me to Scotland. <laughs> he took all his children to Scotland. And I remember, I have these endless memories which are full of love, which are wonderful memories of walking and camping in the rain. I remember the last time I camped with him, I remember I lay in bitter cold water in the, uh, all around me at the bottom of the tank while he snored on until three o'clock in the morning when he immediately woke up and charged out bringing the whole tank down around us and we were shivering and absolutely wet and cold and we packed everything up and got on the lorry to the fish, just to ride on the fish lorry to Mullock and it's a wonderful memory that coldness and all of that. And in these memories of walking down from the Hidden Valley in Glencoe or over Rannoch Moor and all of those memories, most of the time in my memory, it's not just raining, it's raining horizontally, straight into my face. Okay, that's the enormous importance for climate jobs. There are, I discovered by doing research about, uh, for the European Transport Workers Federation, there are three great sources three great resources of renewable energy in Europe. The three that make the most importance. One is the wind resources across all of Siberia. One is the wind and the solar sun resources in Kazakhstan. And the third one of equivalent size is the wind in the North Sea. Um, it is an enormous resource. And whenever, when we do this pamphlet, we talk in great detail about the enormous wind resources um, for, the, for Britain in the North Sea. In fact, I'm well aware from having done the mass of the detailed reports, almost all of that is between Scotland and Norway. <laughs> 
There's a little bit that go up her back <laughs> uh, that you might think of as English, but it's an enormous resource. So Scotland has the political opportunities, it has the resource available, and it has an oil and gas industry that is coming to an end and needs a replacement. So I'd like to start by suggesting to you the slogan, it's Scotland's reign. That is above all else what you are blessed with in this country is bad weather. <laughs> and this is an enormous resource for dealing with climate change. Okay. I'm going to talk about the details of what a climate jobs program, an actual central government program from Scotland, would look like. And then I'm going to talk a bit about what I want you to do to make that really happen. But first, to make any of this real, you have to, the reason we did this report and the 40,000 words of nerdy stuff that's on the internet that you can look up <laughs> Uh, in support of it and so on. The reason we did all of the enormous detailed work you need to do is first of all you need to persuade people that this is real, that this can happen. Just to sketch out what it would mean in Scotland, most of the, uh, most of the emissions from Scotland, as from most country, industrial countries, most of the emissions come from three main sources in Scotland. First of all, from the uh, um, manufacture of electricity, Secondly, from transport, and thirdly, from heating buildings, uh, homes and public buildings of all sorts. Um, and that means that what you mainly have to do is make buildings, um, transport, and electricity production rely completely on, um, uh, on renewable energy. I'll take electricity production first. What you have to do is change, it takes, we think, we think in terms of a climate jobs workforce that in, 50, in Scotland it would be about 100,000 workers over 15 to 20 years could eliminate, in those three sectors, could eliminate, um, uh, could eliminate uh, emissions by almost 100% in those three sectors. Now, be real, 92 to 95% in those three sectors. Um, what you, first of all, electricity, over 20, 15 to 20 years, you replace all of it with renewable energy. One form, the main form here would be offshore wind. Um, and that would have to be complemented with, um, uh, with solar power. And some of it would have to be solar power from England or from France or from other, other parts of Europe exchanged over very long to very large scale grids. For renewable energy to work at 20%, you can have it just concentrated in one place. But to have a 100% renewable energy system, you need to have very large scale grids that connect up production of many kinds in many places. Because the sun isn't shining at night, so solar power doesn't work then. Wind power works better. But when the wind is blowing in Orkney, when the wind isn't blowing in Orkney, it is probably blowing in Cornwall or northern Germany, do you know what I mean? And the same with <clears throat> uh, how much sun you get and so on. You need a mixture. And it's not true it's small scale, and it's not true it's off the grid. You need a mixture of large, uh, of large scale connections. Now, of the 100,000 jobs, this is not, this is 100,000 jobs every year, each year for 15 to 20 years. Of those 100,000 jobs, 50,000 of them would be in renewable energy. Crucially, the majority of those jobs are in manufacturing. And that's the first reason it has to be public sector. If you have one public, integrated public sector corporation that's doing this, then you can have the manufacturer jobs in Scotland. If you don't, you will be compelled by the WTO to put them somewhere else, to buy them in. Uh, to buy all the solar panels and so on in from, uh, in from China and so on. If you want a public investment uh, thing that provides jobs, um, it has to be public sector. The enormous advantage to that though, that it's man mostly manufacturing jobs, is you can put the factories, the plants, wherever you want where people need the jobs. You can put them in the old coal fields, you can put them in Aberdeen, do you know what I mean? The, where the, you can put them where the jobs have gone. You can say to people who need, uh, uh, 
I'll, I'll, I'll come to that to replace some jobs. Is also, they're in the north, this has always been a maritime and a shipbuilding nation. And there are an enormous number of maritime jobs. Um, a great deal of the technology of supplying offshore wind is the same as the technology for supplying <coughs> offshore, offshore oil. Um, and so it's, it's manufacturing jobs. It's the kind of jobs that have been disappearing. What we have got in the entire industrial, everywhere in the industrialized world, is more and more jobs working in the old people's home and more and more jobs working in the Silicon Valley. And the jobs that come in between, the jobs with dignity for working people, are the jobs that have been disappearing. Okay, that would be about 50,000 in jobs. About 20,000 would be in transport. Transport, you need to do two things. First, you need to have a lot of public transport. Get people out of cars and on the buses and trains. And do that by making the buses and trains better and giving them their own lanes. <laughs> so it becomes, uh, in rush hours and in many places, their own roads or lanes all day long. So that the buses get there, get you to work or to school far quicker than they do at the moment. And so the cars get you to work or school far slower. <laughs> um, so a regulation that, that encourages that, but also, uh, but, and this creates an enormous number of jobs because if 20 people drive to work, 30 people drive to work, those 30 people are all working driving to work, but it's not a job. Put those 30 people in a bus, and there's a bus driver's job. It creates a, uh, a number of uh, 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 jobs. It's cheaper for people, but in addition to that, in addition to public transport and massive investment in railways and rail freight and so on, make all of the railways and all of the buses and all of the private cars electric. And you can do that by a simple regulation that says, in five years' time, from 2023 onwards, all vehicles sold in Scotland um, or on the roads for any length of time in Scotland must be electric vehicles. That immediately, even with our present energy mix, reduces your um, emissions, but it massively, would you also say, as soon as possible, all of the, we're going to run, we're going to run, that means instead of the present electrical grid, the electrical system, we need to cover transport as well. We need twice as much energy as we have now. So that's one of the reasons we have so many workers in, um, um, in renewable energy. Um, but all of it is uh, powered by renewable energy. All of it. This, um, and then you eliminate um, all the emissions um, all the emissions from road transport. You're still left with shipping and you're still left with planes. But most of the emissions from planes can be covered. You can, if you have a, it doesn't have to be a high speed rail system, a rail system of kind that runs from Edinburgh to here that does 100 to 125 miles per hour. That rail, was, that rail system will get you from here to Istanbul in 24 hours. <coughs> rail system, those specifications, it will get you to Calcutta in three and a half days. Um, we, um, uh, most of the um, plane transport we don't need. Um, okay. Um, the third thing is buildings. What we have in Britain and in large parts of Scotland is appalling buildings. In turn, you go to Scandinavia, all the houses are warm. <laughs> Everybody's house is warm because if it's not warm, you die. <laughs> Here, we're just on the edge. <laughs> um, it can be cold and damp if you still don't die. Maybe not five or 10 years of your life. But, you know, um, proper insulation. <laughs> Two things. Proper insulation of all, the public, of all the houses and all the public buildings. And not some kind of form of grants. You put up scaffolding and you go down the street. <laughs> street by street. And you insulate the private housing, rented housing, public housing. You insulate the whole thing. And you provide changeover from heating with, um, oil, uh, heating with oil and gas and so on. You provide changeover to electrical systems and heating. You need, which you can do because you now need much less heating because it's insulated properly. And those electrical systems of heating, those are done with electricity that's generated uh, uh, renewably, which is why we have to have three times as much. 
electricity, not two times as much electricity as we do at the moment. Um, <clears throat> people won't be forced to do this. People can live in the cold and so on. They won't necessarily be forced to do it, but almost everybody will want to do it. Those are the main forms of jobs. There are other jobs in education, in agriculture, in waste, um, and so on that we go into in some detail in this booklet. But those are the central ones, those three. Um, oh, the other thing about buildings is it doesn't directly create the jobs, but indirectly creates the jobs, is you change the building regulation to say that every new building, every new public building, every new residential building has to be what they call in Germany a passive house. That the emissions are either, the net emissions are either zero or at most 10%. The technology of how to do this is well established. It costs about 20% more, 20, 25% more than a house. But it wouldn't cost people any more in housing, the effect, because the price of housing is controlled by how much of our incomes we can put aside to grant or pay the mortgage. And what it would do is it would require more labor to build housing, slightly more labor to build housing, but what would compensate for that is that the cost of land would come down as, the, uh, as a part of the full cost. So that is um, uh, more buildings. And as an ex-building worker, deeply, deeply more satisfying. <laughs> and I spent three years of my life building crappy council housing, knowing every step of the way we would discuss it. Those of us who are building it, we never wanted to live in this shit. <laughs> um, it's still up. Um, do you know what I mean? Uh, okay, that's what we need. So, about 100,000 jobs in all. Now, a few more political points to make about that. One is, the, other, the second reason why it has to be public sector um, is that we want to guarantee everybody who loses a job in the high carbon economy because of the regulations, retraining and a job at the same wage in the, in the new economy, in whatever it is, the National Climate Service, whatever you call it, uh, the public sector. We want to guarantee that because it's more, more, more morally right. It's not those men and women's fault. It's morally right that they should be taken care of. But also, if you don't do that, you pull apart the trade union movement and you pull apart the fabric of communities. You set people against each other. The employers who want to preserve the fossil fuel industries can mobilize the people who would lose the jobs. So it's also, uh, it's morally right, it's politically necessary. And it gets us across an argument that, the argument about the GMB. I don't hold against those GMB people that the, the GMB officials that they are arguing against closing down, what they see as closing down their industry. I don't hold it against them because I'm a UCU member. And I can get my union branch and I can get my union conference to agree to climate change. Our logo is on You know what I mean? We support it. Lots, of, lots and lots of activists from UCU. And for that matter, you get the same with the teachers unions uh, or the post office unions and so on. Um, Railway Workers Union, no problem supporting it. But I've been on strike as a university lecturer. I think I've been on 18 fucking one day strikes <laughs> in the last 10 years. And none of them, none of them have been a strike to preserve the jobs of the people in the GMB. I can't get my fellow union members yet to fight for that. And I don't think we lecture the people in the GMB about what they should do until we can get our people to do it. That applies to trade union members, but it applies to everybody who's only a member of Greenpeace or a member of Friends of the Earth or whatever. If you can't get, we're in this together. Instead of blaming those people, we say from the beginning, this is absolutely central. We don't do this if we can't guarantee jobs to people who lose them. Now, the work in calculating how many people that is you have to offer jobs to is, is granular, it's detailed, it's important statistical work to do. There's not that many. By the time you get to the number of people who retire and so on, and also the fact that these industries are hemorrhaging jobs anyway. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's not that many, but it's absolutely necessary to do that. Secondly, the second thing to talk about is how we pay for it. Again, we've done detailed work for Britain. 
and for South Africa um, on how you pay for it. And um, the answer is you pay for it three ways. Um, one way, which gets back about a third of the cost, the detailed numbers are in here, which gets about, about a third of the cost, is when you, these are new jobs and they're taking people uh, off the unemployment lines, or um, the, the government saves um, about a third of the cost of every new worker they hire if it's a public sector job in the benefits they're not paying you and the taxes you are now paying. They save about a third of the cost. We're also producing transportation and we're producing electricity and electricity for transport and people will pay for all of those. There will need to be some scale of subsidy but again it pays for about a third of it. About a third of it is left to be paid for by deficit financing. This is very important because it's very, very... Deficit financing means the government spends more money than it's getting in. And this is a very, very good thing. When governments go to war, they don't mess around. <laughs> they don't say, can we afford this? They just spend the money. <laughs> and they mobilize immediately. Um, uh, the most, and I'll come back to the most important example, but that's what they do. They, but also, when we saw, when the banks were in trouble, when the banks were in trouble in 2008, we discovered that the European Central Bank, the Federal Reserve Bank in New York, and the Bank of England in London, each of them could find, if they had to, 400 billion dollars or pounds or euros, and they could find it on a Tuesday morning, and they could find it up by lunchtime. The banks were in trouble. They could find it like that. And they paid the uh, European Central Bank and the Federal Reserve Bank, uh, both of them, and the Bank of England, you no, know, the bank, not the European Central Bank, the Bank of England and the Federal Reserve Bank between them have paid off, I think it's on the scale of 300 billion pounds in, um, uh, um, oh, what is the, what? Quantitative, Quantitative easing. Quantitative easing is that word. They make up money. Okay. <laughs> all of those subsidies were given to the first set of subsidies was all given to the banks. The second set of subsidies, uh, uh, the first set were all given to the banks. The second set were given through the banks to the stock markets um, to pull them up. This is. Um, and there is a third very important form of quantitative easing. Um, as I said, I've been living for the last year in. Um, in America looking after my 97-year-old father-in-law, and he lives in a depressed, largely white and Latino, working-class town in Missouri, which has been depressed and poor and full of trailers for as long as I can remember, and which is, there are jobs all over the place now. Jobs all over the place. And the biggest sign outside McDonald's and Pizza Hut and Walmart and every single one of them, the really big billboard sign says, hiring now, and how much they're paying. The reason is Trump's tax cuts. It's not true they've gone just to the rich, they've gone to the rich and they've gone to working people. And he hasn't reduced government expenditure. And they are a form. The Democrats are refusing to see that this happened because they only want to give it to the banks. <laughs> but they are a form of stimulus for the economy. Um, they, in these forms, but all of these forms of stimulus for the economy, these are overwhelmingly, the economist Anwar Sheikh calls them trickle down. You give as much money as possible to the rich, the corporations, and the banks, and hope some of it stimulates the rest of the economy. But we never, by and large, we never see it happen. Um, Anwar Sheikh says, go back to the Keynes model. Trickle up. Give the money to the people. <laughs> Make jobs for the people to do. And then everybody sees that the stimulus is there. And you do it with deficit financing. These great uh, industrial economies can afford the deficit financing. This, if you have deficit financing rather than just moving the tax money around, it actually stimulates the number of jobs you have. So in Scotland, you would have an extra 100,000 jobs, less about 10,000 for the people you'd have to take care of who lost their jobs. That's 90,000 plus about 50,000 in the supply chain plus about 20,000 extra from the spending. You would have about 170,000, 160,000 more jobs in Scotland. That's 
an enormous stimulation. Okay. Now, how do you do this? This is the big one. Because this is, this is what I want you to do. I want you to try to make this real in Scotland. There are two ways of doing this, and I think you have to do both. You have to, one is a British way. We have half persuaded Corbyn and McDonald. McDonald was a very strong supporter of this campaign for many, many years before he became in his present position in the shadow cabinet. Um, he knows what we're on about. We have half persuaded them and half not persuaded them to do a climate jobs program when they get into government. They're making noises and then they're making other noises. It's kind of in the balance. The moment when it will come crucial is if there is a Labour government and there is a serious recession. This, there has been since the 1830s a, um, a serious recession in capitalist economies. Yeah, it's only five minutes ago. It's uh, capitalist economies every six to 10 years. We're now at 10 years. It could be another year, another two years, another three years, but unless that business cycle has stopped, which is unlikely, the best sign that the crash is coming is you start to get opinion pieces of, in the financial press saying the business cycle no longer applies. Um, but the, um, at that moment, at that moment when unemployment suddenly shoots right back up, we will either need massive amounts of deficit financing for which this is the best way to do it. This is the best political way to do it. We will either need that or labor will preside over the, um, the destruction of the British economy again. And that would be Labour out of office for 20 years. So that's one set of things we have to prepare for and press for through the trade union movement but in every other way we have from below. But the other, the other thing is this could be done by a Scottish government. It could be done by a Scottish government. And the Scottish political atmosphere is nowhere near as neoliberal or right-wing as the British as a whole. Um, there is far more space. It is a far smaller country, which means you can get at the people far more easily. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You can get at the parties they go to, you can get at their local constituency offices. The networks, are, the networks are small enough that you can work towards them. It's small enough that you can imagine you could possibly do it. What I'd like you to do is to find the people in this room are a good start. A good start, but you need more people <coughs> representing a wider variety of social organizations and power and mobilization in Scotland. But to get those people together and say, we're going to really try to do this. This is not a tradi transitional demand to prove that capitalism does not work. <laughs> this is not a socialist program for what we would do if we had a socialist government. This is not a good idea that we have as the Green Party about what to do, but we want to make this actually work. We can make this actually work. It is possible to do it. Once you embark on that, if you have the people, you have to do, you have to do all the research that goes into a book like this, and more than that, and God, you have the brains, and you have the academic people, and you have the skilled resources in Scotland to do that. I mean, um, you know, your tradition of education um, is, is enormous. Uh, you can do that standing in your heads, and it's absolutely necessary to do it. But more important is the mobilization. For the mobilization that you want, there are three legs. You have to walk on three legs. One is the trade union movement. Broadly, the people in this room. <laughs> and the people that you know, and most of the Scottish GUC and so on. One is the trade union movement. But the trade union movement, between us, as rank and file members, we know almost everybody in society. We speak to almost everybody, down the pub or Chris, you know, or whatever. We speak to almost everybody, but as an organizing movement, we're growing old, and we're not as strong as we once were. And we have to think of climate jobs as a way that we make our movement strong again, as it ought to be. But we can't do it on our own. The second leg is, if there's 4,000 people 
um, on Blackfriars Bridge. I mean, somebody was telling me, I think in the queue for the toilet, about uh, the last meeting in Glasgow, uh, uh, starting the Extinction Rebellion. You can do the same thing in Scotland. That's ma that is massive in different forms. I mean, that's one form, it'll take other forms. Massive mobilization of young people for direct action. That's the second wing. And you have to persuade those people that this is a good idea. And you persuade those people by being arrested. <laughs> that's how you persuade them. <laughs> um, the third wing is to work your way through what's laughingly called civil society. But work your way through the churches and the mosques and the councils and get the, you know, get all the trade union, have a, a program, a model thing, charter, whatever you call it, and get um, SNP, local councillors, Green Party, local councillors, Labour Party, union representatives, priests, pastors, uh, you know, the lot, uh, to sign up. So that you know you have a massive movement. And you know you can fight and win an election on that. That's what I want you to think about doing. Um, I think if you're serious about it and you organize around it, I think with the way the world is going, you're in the chance. And it matters because if you win it in Scotland, we can win it in England. We'll just say that the labor movement, the environmental movement, the labor party, and so on in England, we'll say they've done it in Scotland. Look! <laughs> they've done it. They're happy. <laughs> it works. <laughs> here, is a, here is a woman from the winter, uh, wind, uh, winter by manufacturing plant <laughs> outside Glasgow. Here she is. And she's going to talk to you <laughs> about what they've done and how they fought for it and how they we can win it in England. If we win it in Britain, we can win it in the world. People know, in this, people know a solution is needed. They know a solution about jobs is needed. They know a solution about climate change is needed. What holds people back is, shall I talk about what gives people confidence now, or shall I talk about it when I come back at the end? Can I just check, check with Pete? We've got to full 30, haven't we? Is that for yes. discussion? And then we're going back into... Yeah, we've got yeah. half an hour discussion. Oh, OK. Yeah. Um, shall we... Maybe, yeah, just finish on that, and then we'll maybe go to some questions. OK. It sounds like a big project. It sounds like an overwhelming project. I think it can be done. And I think that if 10 people in this room decide to do it, you will be able to make it happen. Whether you'll be able to win, I don't know. But I know that you'll, I know that you'll be able to build a big campaign, a serious campaign, and that you may be able to win. When we come back at the end of the discussion, I'm going to talk about the problem of confidence and the feeling that everything is so overwhelming above us and the odds are so stacked against us that we can never break through. I'm going to talk about that. But now, I want to stay with the... Um, I want to stay with the details of what a campaign would look like in Scotland and how it would be built and go about the discussion now. Thank you very much.